Hi, this is Yohus Sapin Bharatiya and welcome to State of Energy and we are here at John Hopkins University in Washington DC and today we have with us once again Alex Thornton, Executive Director of Life Energy. Alex, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. It's my pleasure to host you again. We talked a few weeks ago, so, uh, but I want to quickly remind our viewers once again, it's good to remind them what is Life Energy all about, especially in the setup you are here where you have policymakers because this is the event that we are covering. So from that context, what role do you see of LF Energy? Sure. We really exist at the intersection of, of two mega trends. One is the energy transition, which is the effort to decarbonize our energy system, which is needed to address global warming. And the other one is open source, which has become you know, the de facto way of building modern technology. And so we sit right at that intersection. Um, and really our goal is to uh, build up the open source ecosystem to accelerate the energy transition, to decarbonize more quickly. Um, so specifically in the context of you know, being in Washington DC, policy conference, um, we're trying to open the eyes of uh, especially policymakers and regulators of the, the power of open source in accelerating innovation and bringing to market solutions more quickly than before by having all of the different stakeholders collaborate rather than uh, duplicate effort on the foundational layers of technology. How do you see open source kind of accelerate the, the first problem that you talked about? I mean, it's common in, in many industries, and this is where open source really excels, is you have a common problem that various actors in a market need to solve in order to actually participate in that market. And um, oftentimes what you find are proprietary solutions that solve that foundational problem. Um, and all of the actors who wanna compete have to solve that same foundational problem. And so it's duplicative effort, right? Everybody's reinventing the wheel. Um, and so the opportunity, especially in such an interconnected, interoperable multi-vendor system, such as uh, energy and power, is um, how do we avoid that duplication of effort? Um, oftentimes when it's really trying to enact policies, trying to enact le regulation, like these are things that we want to streamline to reduce friction rather than uh, compete on basically table stakes for the market. What kind of discussions you are seeing in the hallway when you've talked with folks and the sessions and you sit there? The nice thing uh, of getting together like this is you have a lot of good collisions, right? People who don't normally see each other that are able to establish relationships and, and collaboration. Um, and so to, to highlight the conference, you know, day one, uh, we're largely talking about data and data related decarbonization solutions. Uh, it's important to have data to drive decarbonization to prove that you've actually decarbonized. Um, and getting access to that data is difficult. Um, day two, we're going to be spending about half the day around uh, modeling and simulation. So how do we better plan uh, for scenarios? And then uh, rounding out with open source best practices and security. So really demonstrating, hey, you know, open source is mature, it's secure, this is how it works. Um, and so there's a wide variety of stakeholders who are here in terms of private companies, NGOs, um, you know, government entities, researchers. Um, and so what we're seeing with them is trying to learn from each other in terms of the solutions uh, that they're talking about. Um, and today, that just so happens to be data focused of, hey, uh, we didn't realize you had that same data problem. We do too. Let's continue figuring out ways to work on it. Through these discussions, you know, what role do you see of data in the, whether we talk about the whole transformation that uh, the players are going through at the same time, the decarbonization goal a lot of corporations have, you know, so we are talking two different industries, but the goals are more or less same. What role data plays there based on these discussions today? It's essential. You, you, we, we can't actually decarbonize without data. And, um, you know, there, there are two immediate reasons that come to mind. There are probably more. Um, but the first one is, uh, without data, what we do in terms of power systems construction is we overbuild. Right, we, uh, we add in safety tolerances, assume worst case scenario. So assume that everybody on your block charges their electric vehicle at the same time. Okay, then we need to build the distribution grid to handle that scenario. 
But we know in reality that's not actually the case, right? You might come home at a different time from work or there are different tariffs or rate mechanisms to incentivize kind of smoothing out the charging. Um, you need data to drive those sorts of decisions around grid planning and what sort of capacity you actually need. Um, you also need data to prove out uh, any decarbonization claims that you're making. So there are uh, a number of uh, policy and rulemaking decisions. Uh, one that's called the 45V hydrogen tax credit um, of what qualifies for green hydrogen. And uh, according to the guidance issued by the government, uh, green hydrogen qualifies if it uses uh, hourly data, granular data to prove that it's using carbon-free energy. Uh, it's uh, geographically proximate and it's additional carbon free energy resource. You need data to prove those claims, basically to stamp your product to say this is green. Um, you know, so we also have SEC guidance coming in around scope one and scope two carbon accounting. You need data to prove to the SEC uh, that you are actually performing carbon accounting accurately and can back up your claims. So data is essential both for the planning process both for your accounting process. And I didn't even get into the operational process of, you know, how do you in real time orchestrate all of these flexible resources and variable renewable generation? Uh, the grid is getting more and more complicated um, and we need data to drive the actual orchestration and optimization of that. How is LF Energy kind of building an even playing field to, as you also mentioned earlier, there's less duplication of work? Mm -hmm. And if you can also mention some projects that are kind of either in the early stage of maturity to replace some of those fragmented or do-it-yourself projects. The data world is extremely fragmented. And the number of speakers that we had today talked to just that of there's fragmentation. Even within a single TSO or DSO, there, is, there are data silos within there. Um, so there are many levels of challenges here. Um, some of the projects that we're working on, um, so Trolley, uh, which is uh, an open source specification implementing FERC Order 881 around uh, transmission line ratings, um, that addresses a problem with uh, the Mid-Continental ISO had of data sharing with all of its different stakeholders and actors and all the different permutations there. Um, you know, they sit in the middle of the continent and have many neighbors and they need to share data with all of those neighbors. And uh, they put forth Trolley to consolidate the industry around one standard rather than have to, you know, speak to the neighbor on the right in one language and the neighbor on the left in another. Um, and so that's one concrete example. We also have the uh, carbon data specification uh, where we're working on data standards around uh, customer data uh, as well as uh, power systems data. Um, and that's, that's more driven on the uh, consumer side of electricity, less so on the utility DSO, TSO side, but we're really working hard to get the DSOs, TSOs to buy into that, hopefully solve some problems that they have internally and align all of our efforts to just reduce friction around data sharing overall. Do you see any contrast in the market in the Europe versus US when it comes to fragmentation or usage of data? Yeah, there's a big difference. Europe, uh, generally with energy transition, Europe is a couple of years ahead of us. Uh, and, and regarding data sharing, there's no difference. Um, they tend to have more uh, centralized direction and governance of the data. Uh, that's not to say that the data situation is perfect, um, but it's much easier to get access to uh, grid data. It's much easier to get access to your own meter data in Europe than it is here. And last time when we talked, you said, you know, this year the focus will be more on the North American space as well. Uh, this is April. Uh, where do you see VR now? We still have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, good news. So, Hydro Quebec uh, just joined as a member of LF Energy. So, that's a North American utility. Um, and that's fantastic. We're really excited to work with them. Um, and we're also talking with another, uh, other American utilities. But it's still, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discovery that needs to be done. Um, open source is not familiar for many people in utilities. Um, they're used to different kinds of collaboration through uh, traditional standard bodies, you know, IEEE, IEC, ISO. 
um, that have been incredibly useful and valuable and continue to be, um, but are different in open source in terms that they're, they tend to be more closed. They tend to be more uh, top-down planning. You know, hey, we're going to define a spec uh, that will plan the grid for the next 20 years. Um, whereas open source is, you know, much more publicly accessible, much more built in the open, uh, and tends to be more nimble and agile. Uh, and so I think of those as complementary approaches. Um, and one of my goals is to try to introduce that complementary approach to what utilities tend to be familiar with already. Um, but it's a lot of work. Anybody who's works works in uh, utility uh, utilities in North America that. You know, it's it's a slow moving traditional industry, um, and so we're just going to be patient and keep at it. When we look at LF Energy, you folks are very active in uh, Europe. You mentioned, you know, the first you know, member from the North America as well. What about the rest of the world? When are you going to save them? <laughs> I don't know if I can say I'm saving anyway. You know, I, I'm, I'm hoping to bring together people to to save ourselves. Uh, I think we have our hands full with Europe and North America for the time being, um, you know, but I think there's lots of opportunities, Latin America in particular, um, you know, Asia, definitely a huge opportunity there as well. Um, so I think we just need to figure out, you know, how do, how do we build up communities in each of these geographies so that they become more self-sustaining? And then that gives us bandwidth to move on and, and also leverage from the community to demonstrate results that makes it easier in the next place. Uh, so, for example, Europe, we have fantastic champions in Europe already. A number of utilities are already members. They're already contributing in our projects. Um, and so, you know, while I wouldn't say that's necessarily on autopilot, but we have champions within Europe already. Um, and now we need to leverage that to find our champions in North America and the US. Um, and then we use that as a springboard to go to other geographies. What are some of the most pressing problems, you know, whether you look at Europe or, I mean, since let's talk about Europe, uh, with this uh, the transition that is going on, where TSOs, DSOs, they feel the pain, the pinch. And, you know, and instead of solving it themselves, they look up at LF Energy as a catalyst to help solve those problems? What are those? Um, I mean, it's, it's really just how quickly things on the grid are changing, you know, and, and this isn't just Europe, it's, you know, US as well, and I think throughout much of the world, electric load is increasing for the very first time in decades. Um, and so you have uh, organizations, entire industries that were used to uh, flat growth, or maybe, maybe 1% or so. Um, and now forecasts just keep getting ratcheted up. And you can feel the, the challenges already with, you know, uh, queues to connect to the grid are just getting longer and longer. You know, I think uh, I heard something, the Netherlands, you, you literally can't connect new load to the grid. There's no space. Um, you know, that sort of issue is happening all around the world. You have uh, transmission distribution congestion. You know, it's being felt very acutely in Europe, also other places in the world. And so, you know, it's, it's a different paradigm for the grid now than it was even five years ago. And the rate of change is much quicker than it was before. And I think that's where uh, a digital approach and open source really come into play because uh, we need to move more quickly and we need to prioritize adaptability. You know, I was, I was speaking with um, a system operator in Europe last week and, um, you know, we basically got on the topic of, of planning for the future and utilities typically they like to plan, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the future. But because things are so dynamic right now, there are so many unknown unknowns, it's not really possible. Um, and so that's where, you know, virtualization of hardware, software defined technologies and open source to accelerate that really come into play. It provides that flexibility and agility to, to handle whatever challenge comes at us in the future. Yes, uh, we have EVs, you know, and I think things are going to get even worse when everybody has an EV at home charging. So the load on the grid, I mean, when summer comes in, people's AC, you know, the, the grid cannot handle that load. You know? So we'll see. I remember early days, actually, you know, we used to have very long discussions, you know, where we'll also talk about 
how China is building new uh, material for the lines, you know, so the less electricity is lost during transmission, which is outside of the scope of LF energy. But what kind of changes are you seeing widely in the industry as being an enthusiast in the energy space when we talked last time, where even if they are outside of the scope of LF energy, but ultimately they are going to help with this energy transition or yeah. to bring the load on the grid lower. I want to go back to something you mentioned where if everybody have, has EVs, things will get worse. I don't think that's a foregone conclusion because you could also think that EVs, if handled as grid contributing assets, could actually make things much better, right? You're just now adding millions of batteries to the grid, complemented by variable renewable generation the batteries can help even out the peaks and valleys of that generation. So, so there's a lot of opportunity to use EVs as a grid contributing asset. That doesn't mean it'll be easy or there will be no problems, uh, but it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, on the you know, things outside of the scope of LF Energy, so uh, the DOE has, has been very prolific in, in advocating for non-traditional approaches to expanding grid capacity and addressing our problems. Um, many of those are digital solutions, but they also recommend a lot of, um, you know, for example, reconductoring of transmission lines. So you have existing transmission lines that need new capacity. Um, and instead of trying to build a completely new line, saying, well, let's take off this legacy wire, add on a wire that has more capacity, and therefore you get more transmission capacity. And then you don't have to deal with right of way issues or other challenges that come with building new transmission capacity. So that's that's one way. Um, that's more, you know, uh, physical infrastructure based way of, of making progress here. Alex, thank you so much once again, sitting down and talk about LF Energy. Thanks for great insight. And as usual, I look forward to chat with you again. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was great doing this in person too.